Hello, everybody. Welcome to TESOL 2250. Um, so today uh, we're going to finish up all of our verb types. We worked on the first three in the last video and in class. In class and so we're going to uh, continue with numbers four, five, and six, VG verbs, VC verbs, and the verb be. Okay. So um, some verbs, like the verb give, require two noun phrases after them to be complete. And this is what we call a VG verb. And notice that uh, the G is lowercase and not capital, like we saw with VI and VL. And the reason this is, is because we're not talking about a specific subtype of a uh, verb, like we were with linking verbs and intransitive verbs. Rather, we are just saying that this verb patterns like the very specific word give. And so for that reason, we're going to uh, do a lowercase g uh, when we do this on our tree diagrams. So this, for example, uh, has the formula x gave someone something. For example, the school board gave the teachers a raise. Now we notice here that we've got two noun phrases. The first one in this phrase, uh, the first one in this sentence is the teachers, and the second noun phrase is a raise. So the verb give and other verbs that are like give um, require these two noun phrases. We can't just say the school board gave the teachers or the school board gave a raise. We always need that second noun phrase for this to be complete. And so uh, with this verb, we introduce a new type of noun phrase object, specifically an indirect object. So we've seen direct objects before with VT verbs. These are noun phrases that receive the action of the verb, um, but now we have an indirect object as well. And this is the noun phrase that receives the direct object noun or noun phrase. So you can imagine the action of the verb is transferred twice, first to the direct object, and then indirectly to the next noun phrase or the indirect object. So when we think of the sentence, the school board gave the teachers a raise. First, the action of giving transfers to a raise, and then that raise transfers to the teachers. So that is called an indirect object. And the teachers in this case is the indirect object. And that's the first thing we see. And then we also get the direct object, a raise after that. So you'll notice that with VG verbs, you can actually create an alternate structure. Um, instead of saying the school board gave the teachers a raise, you can instead say the school board gave a raise to the teachers. So this is something unique about VG verbs is we can reverse the order of the two noun phrases, the indirect object and the direct object. So let's look at this sentence. The billionaire bought his daughter a house. Now, when we think about what the alternate structure is for that sentence, we have to figure out, well, first our verb is bought, buy in this case, and then you see two noun phrases, his daughter, a house. So let's reverse those two and we'll get the alternate structure. The billionaire bought a house for his daughter. Ah, now notice we have to add four or two, uh, whenever we reverse the indirect object with the direct object. Specifically, when you put um, the indirect object last, you have to have a two or a four before it. If the indirect object is first, then you don't need that. So when we think about indirect objects of uh, VG, I want you to notice, uh, we're gonna put this on our trees, uh, how we write this. We're just gonna write a capital I, capital O, B, J. And that means indirect object. Now, uh, to make sure that you're looking at an indirect object, make sure that it's animate or human. Usually indirect objects are animate and, hum and usually human. There are some exceptions to that, which we'll see in a minute. So let's look at this one. The billionaire bought his daughter a house. Now, in this instance, 
his daughter is animate and and is human, right? Usually when if you are an indirect object, in order to receive something, you have to be uh, somehow capable of receiving it. And at the very minimum, that means you must be animate. The school board gave a raise to the teachers, definitely animate, I guess human, <laughs> the teachers, but they are capable of receiving that raise. Mom gave the cat a flea treatment. Now here, this one's animate, but not human, but still we can understand the cat as receiving a flea treatment. But occasionally you'll hear uh, inanimate, non-human things being used with the verb give or verbs like it. Like the mechanic gave my car a quick tune-up. So in this case, we're kind of construing the car as being somehow capable of receiving, even though it's not really. This is not the most prototypical use of this uh, VG verb though. So let's try out the verb sent. And let's see if it's a VG verb. We also want to be able to explain how we can tell whether it's a VG verb or not. And so I'm going to show you basically a proof uh, of how you can tell the difference between a VG and a VT verb. And we're going to use sent as our model. OK. So we have the sentence. The florist sent roses to her husband. Now you might be looking at sent and saying, huh, I, I think this is a VG verb. I see this to here and I see a noun phrase, her husband, and I see roses. That looks like a noun or a noun phrase. So I got two noun phrases after the verb and I see the preposition to. And the preposition to or for uh, usually signals that an indirect object is coming up afterward. So I think I have a VG verb, but I'm not 100% sure. So what am I going to do? I'm going to reverse the two noun phrases and see if it makes sense. The florist sent her husband roses. Ah, yes, that works. So I can say, all right, I've reversed the two noun phrases, and it seems to work. It looks like I got a VG verb. Now let's look at another example sentence with send. The florist sent roses to Cincinnati. Okay, again, I'm looking at this verb and I'm thinking, okay, well, I've got a noun after the verb sent, which is roses, and I see another noun, Cincinnati. But here, this one might actually be a VT instead. Well, how do we know? Let's try to reverse the two noun phrases and see if it makes sense. The florist sent Cincinnati the roses. Uh, that doesn't quite sound right. Mainly, and I put a question mark there because maybe it does sound okay to you. But unless Cincinnati is somebody's name, it sounds a little bit strange because the whole city cannot receive the roses. Now, what's going on here is send is actually a VT in this sentence context. Um, Cincinnati is not capable of receiving. So we can't say that to Cincinnati uh, is signaling an indirect object. Rather, this is a prepositional phrase functioning as an adverb of place. So when we see, as I said earlier, you know, two and four prepositional phrases usually indicate that an indirect object is coming up, but not always. And this is exactly what we're seeing in the second instance. So the other point I want to make is that remember that verbs can actually change their type depending on the sentence context. The part of speech of a verb or the category of a verb is not fixed until it's situated in the sentence. So we think your mental dictionary, or what we call your lexicon, actually has two entries for sent. One as a VG in certain contexts, and another as a VT in others. So just like any other transitive verb, a VG verb can be made passive. The difference is that VG verbs are going to actually make two distinct passive sentences, depending on whether you want to focus on the direct object or the indirect object. So VT, as you recall, can make a passive sentence, but only one passive sentence. Here we're going to see two with a VG. So let's take the example sentence, my kids fed tuna to the cat. Well, feed in this instance, it looks like a VG. 
And we can actually take the cat at the end of the sentence, we move it to the beginning to make a passive if we want to focus on the cat. So the cat here is the indirect object. The cat was fed tuna by my kids. Okay, now that's a possible sentence, but let's say we want to instead focus on the direct object, tuna. In other words, what was fed to the cat? Oh, tuna was fed to the cat by my kids. So we can instead do a direct object focus and put tuna in the beginning of the sentence. Okay, so the VG formula looks a little bit more complicated, but um, if we just break this down into its individual parts, it's really not too bad, okay? So this reads a complete sentence containing a VG verb, two place transitive verb, must have a noun phrase acting as a subject, followed by the VG verb. And this can be followed by a noun phrase acting as an indirect object, followed by a noun phrase acting as the direct object. So that's one possibility. Or it can be followed by a noun phrase direct object, and then either the preposition to or for, and then a noun phrase functioning as the indirect object. So you see two sets of curly braces here. Uh, one is contained within the other, depending on which path we take for the VG verb. So uh, this is going to be one of your homework sentences to diagram, but um, if you want to see where it is in the lesson, you're going to diagram this sentence, I caught you a delicious bass. And um, you're going to see a few other practice sentences. We're going to do this both for homework and in class. If you want to try and work on them uh, uh, while you're watching the video, you can just pause the video uh, and do and start them now. Okay, so let's look at a couple more uh, verbs, uh, particularly the verb leave and deliver, both in past tense. The tense doesn't matter. So we have the sentence, Thomas Jefferson left a marvelous legacy for America. Now you might look at that and you say, oh, I see a preposition for, and I remember that if I see two or four, that often indicates that an indirect object is coming up. So let's again reverse, uh, rearrange the indirect object with the direct object. Thomas Jefferson left America a marvelous legacy. Now, can we say that? Yeah, I think you could say that. Although some might argue, well, maybe that sounds a little bit like the Cincinnati thing that we were talking about earlier. Uh, that's up to your own interpretation. But I could, I could definitely say that. Thomas Jefferson left America a marvelous legacy. So we're almost kind of treating America as if it's animate and can in fact receive a marvelous legacy. So, and that's a, a kind of a point I wanna make is that a lot of these verbs are not exactly, um, there aren't hard and fast rules as to which category they fit into. Much can be argued based on your own interpretation. So another sentence that we see here is the trucks delivered the bricks to the building site. Now we wanna see if deliver is a VG or a VT. Now, again, I'm seeing a two and I see a noun phrase after it, often tells me that's a VG, but it may not be. But let's reverse the two noun phrases. The trucks delivered the building site, the bricks. Now that one definitely doesn't sound right to me and probably not to you either. So we can safely conclude that deliver is not a VG, rather it's a VT verb, and this to the building site is just a prepositional phrase functioning as an adverb of place. It just simply answers the question where. So the next verb, uh, that we have is another two-place transitive verb called a VC verb. So again, we've got two two-place transitive verbs. So we saw a VG and now we have VC. The C, uh, lowercase c in VC, is, uh, stands for the verb consider. So these are verbs that pattern like consider. 
And it's important to note that for VG verbs and VC verbs, there aren't very many verbs that fit into these categories. So if you're not really sure and you're looking at a diagram and you're like, hmm, I don't, I don't know whether I'm looking at a VG or a VC, it's probably neither of those. It's probably a VT. The most common verb type that we have, most verbs are a VT. So if you're not sure, just put VT and you'll probably be right. Anyway, okay, so let's look at this sentence. The Republicans consider Democrats big spenders. Now here we have our VC verb consider. That's the most prototypical uh, verb of this type and that's why it's named after it. And then you see uh, two noun phrases. The first noun phrase is a direct object. And then you have something else, another noun phrase called an object complement. Now we're going to abbreviate that O-B-J-C-O-M-P, ob objcomp is what it's going to look like. So the object complement is, uh, and anytime you have a complement, a complement is much like a predicate. It's just telling you a little bit more about another constituent. But more specifically, an object complement or any complement is something that um, another constituent requires in order to be complete. Okay, that's what complements are. So object complements give more information about the object, the direct object in this case. And that's why it's called an object complement. It completes the direct object or tells us a little bit more about the direct object. Because I can't just say the Republicans consider Democrats. No, you're gonna ask, they consider Democrats what? There needs to be a what afterward. So, that's what we're seeing there. We're seeing that object complement following the direct object. In this case, it's a noun phrase. Here again is another example sentence. Some rock fans consider Bob Dylan old fashioned. Now we'll note that old fashioned is talking about Bob Dylan, the direct object. So this is not a noun phrase though. Rather, it's an adjective phrase. So an adjective phrase is another type of object complement that we can have. Once again, object complements complete the idea of the verb. They come after a direct object and they say something more about the direct object. We can't just say some rock fans consider Bob Dylan and just leave it at that. We need to have something after. So, so far we've seen a noun phrase as an object complement, and we've seen an adjective phrase as an object complement. Now I want you to note how I write the abbreviations for all of these constituents with adjective phrases. This is what we're gonna do on our trees. Okay, so we can either have a noun phrase or an adjective phrase. There's one other type of phrase that we can also take as the object complement, but we're gonna see that in a minute. Let's look at these two sentences. Students consider grammar the most interesting subject. I know that's true. No, it's not. But the most interesting subject, oh, that's a noun. Looks like we have a noun phrase. We can also say students consider grammar interesting. There's our adjective phrase, object complement. And what's interesting about, what's interesting? What's interesting about adjective phrase, object complements is they're gonna end in this ing. It's an adjective in, ending in ing. And I want you to compare that to other types of adjectives that we've seen before. Namely, uh, the uh, predicate adjective that we see after a vl. It's in a different form. So a lot of people will say, okay, um, VC and VL look kind of similar. You know, in much the same way that we have an object complement, we also have a predicate adjective or predicate noun. But it's important to remember that with VL verbs, if you see a, an adjective at the end of the sentence, it's always going back to the subject. It's telling us more about the subject. It's like an equal sign. The students seem interested. Well, interested is being applied to the students. Whereas with the VC, 
the students consider grammar interesting. Well, interesting is actually applying to back to grammar, the direct object. It's not talking about the students. And so what's interesting about this is that you notice the different forms. Uh, when you have a predicate adjective, it's got interested, ed. And when you have the, uh, the uh, object complement adjective phrase, it ends in ing. And when you reverse those two things or try to reverse them, you either get something that doesn't mean exactly what you want it to mean, or uh, it, it just is ungrammatical. So if I reversed interested and interesting, if I say that the students seem interesting, well, that's a different sentence entirely. And I cannot say the students consider grammar interested. So this is something to note that, um, you know, the adjective after VLs is going to usually end in this ED ending. An adjective after VCs is going to end in ING. So here are a few more words that fit the VC paradigm. And again, VC is a pretty small class of verbs. We don't have very many of those. Think, found, deem, make, get. Again, we have a few examples here. Think, my mother thinks my husband a liar. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that seems almost archaic and like it should be pronounced with a British accent for some reason. You almost never really hear people using think in this particular type of construction. But nevertheless, it does still exist, and so that's why it's there. Found. My brother found the hotel bed to be uncomfortable. That sounds a little bit better. I want you to notice, though, we have this to be here. Oh, this is a new uh, thing. It's, it's not immediately followed by a, an adjective or a noun phrase. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Deem. The court deemed her an unfit parent. So notice we have her as our noun. It's a pronoun. And an unfit parent is going to be the object complement, a noun phrase. Make. That sweater makes me itchy. Sometimes get can even be a VC verb. Speed display signs get drivers to slow down. Ah, and once again, we have this to slow down, which we haven't seen yet. But I do want to caution you that most of these verbs um, frequently function as other verb types, depending on the sentence context. So if I say, you think too much, now I'm using think as a VI. You think. How much? Too much. I found my watch. Here's a VT. I'm going to make an origami statue, also VT. I have to get some ice cream. I'll consider your offer later. All of these are VTs. So once again, this points to the idea that VT is going to be the most common verb that you're going to see. If you're not sure if not what type of verb it is, it's probably a VT. So the sentence construction makes the verb what it is. The slot makes the verb what it is. So here is our VC verb formula. And we're going to add one more little thing uh, that we saw in a couple of the example sentences on the previous slide. So my formula reads, a complete sentence containing a VC verb must have a noun phrase acting as a subject followed by the VC verb. This must be followed by a noun phrase functioning as direct object. This must be followed by one of three things, either a noun phrase, adjective phrase, or an infinitival phrase functioning as object complement. So let's look at this infinitival phrase. This is a new one we added. And we saw it in uh, one of the previous sentences, two of them actually, but here's the example again. My brother found the hotel bed to be uncomfortable. Now, another way you could just say that is my brother found the hotel bed uncomfortable. That's okay. But we can also add that to be, and to be is uh, an infinitival phrase. So uh, this is to plus a verb. We call it infinitival because whenever you have a verb with to in front of it, it has no tense. In other words, no time. 
In other words, it's infinite. That's where infinitival phrase comes from. So we're going to label that as INFPH. So infinitival phrases, you see here, 2B is the most common one that we're going to see with VCs. B does not have any tense because it's got this 2 in front of it. We can also modify a sentence we saw earlier to have an infinitival phrase object complement. Some rock fans consider Bob Dylan to be old fashioned. Note that VC is transitive. Um, so it can be made passive just like any other transitive verb, just like VT, just like VG. Um, the only difference is that with VCs, you're going to get just one passive construction. Unlike VG, which can have two distinct passive constructions. So let's take a look at some active versus passive sentences. My mother thinks my husband a liar. To make that passive, my husband is thought to be a liar by my mother. Okay. My brother found the hotel bed to be uncomfortable. The hotel bed was found to be uncomfortable by my brother. Some rock fans consider Bob Dylan old-fashioned, passive voice. Bob Dylan is considered old-fashioned by some rock fans. Now that one sounds a little bit more natural. Once again, one of the homework sentences you're gonna diagram is the court deemed her an unfit parent. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. What about B? I mean, we've been talking about a lot of different kinds of verbs, but we haven't really talked about B. A lot of people, and in fact, a lot of grammar books will put B in as a linking verb because it does pattern very similarly to linking verbs in some ways. However, we are going to consider B a distinct category all on its own, and we're gonna label it in our tree as B. Exactly that, capital B, capital E. Because as we're gonna see, while B may be similar to VLs in a lot of ways, it also behaves very differently than VLs in others. So it kind of has to be its own category. Once again, there's the VL formula, you know, if you can recall. You have a noun phrase subject, the VL, and then either a noun phrase predicate noun or an adjective phrase predicate adjective following it, okay? So let's see if this is kind of similar to B. All right, she is smart. Well, here we have the verb be in its various irregular forms that we're gonna see. And it kind of looks like we're saying she equals smart. Smart is an adjective, predicate adjective. So, you know, kind of looks like a VL so far. She is my sister. Okay. It kind of looks like she equals my sister, and my sister is a noun phrase, predicate noun. All right, so that one checks out. It looks like a VL still. But then when we get to locations, then it doesn't behave like a VL. She is at home. Well, we're not saying she equals at home. So at home is not a predicate anything on she. So that one doesn't work. So for this reason, again, B patterns with linking verbs for predicate adjectives and nouns, but can also be used to indicate location and linking verbs don't do that. So it's gotta be its own category. Here's another issue with grouping B in with the VL category. It can be moved to form a question, but VL verbs can't do this. So let's take the sentence, the children are happy. Now, if I have this sentence and I want to make it a question, I have to take uh, the version of B that we see here as R. Got to take that version of B and I'm going to move it to the front of the sentence around the subject. Are the children happy? But if I try to do the same thing with a VL, then I get Yoda speech. The children seem happy. Seem the children happy? That's ungrammatical. So B has to be its own category. So here is uh, the formula for B. 
looks almost the same as linking verbs. The only difference is we're going to add something on the bottom here. A complete sentence containing a be verb must have a noun phrase acting as a subject, followed by the be verb. This must be followed by either noun phrase predicate noun, adjective phrase predicate adjective, or some sort of adverb of place, which is functioning as a predicate adverb. Ah, interesting, a predicate adverb. So she is at home. At home is predicating on where she is, but it's not really saying anything about uh, her. It's not, it's not functioning as an equal sign. So these things, these predicate nouns and predicate adjectives and predicate adverbs, they say something more about the subject. And they're what we call subject complements. They complete the construction. So we already saw object complements earlier with VC, or excuse me, yes, VC. But now we're seeing some subject complements, okay? But we don't need to write subject complement. It's just there for your, uh, for your understanding. We're gonna write it just as we see it here in the formula. So I can say, my mom was a doctor, that's all right. My mom was grumpy, that's fine. So again, a predicate noun and predicate adjective respectively. But I cannot just say, my mom was. Now other languages would have a similar uh, construction to this and you could say something like this, but not English. Can't just say, my mom was. What, my mom was where? That's where we need that adverb of place, in the house, in the living room, in the car, et cetera. Okay, so now we have seen uh, three transitive verbs, VT, VG, and VC. And then we've seen three non-transitive verbs, which would be our VI, VL, and B. And if you want to distinguish those two categories, always try to make them passive and see if it works. All transitive verbs can be made passive, but VI, VL, and B cannot be made passive. VT and VC verbs create one passive sentence. So for example, my landlord prorated the rent Prorated is a VT, I, and I can move the rent to the front of the sentence and get the rent was prorated by my landlord. The court considers him guilty, can move uh, him to the front of the sentence. I get he is considered guilty by the court. Remember that VG verbs create two passive sentences with the example of my kids fed the tuna to the cat. Okay, so we've looked at uh, verbs that are not transitive, VIs, VLs, and B, and also three verbs that are transitive, VT, VG, and VC. So these are the six verb types um, that account for the vast majority of verbs that you're gonna read, speak, and write. Not all of them. Some grammar books have eight different categories of verbs, but the vast majority of verbs that you'll see in the sentence frames around these uh, are all hinged upon six verb types.